Welcome to this video about the BlackBerry Playbook, a tablet computer designed by Research in Motion to try and enter the then lucrative tablet computer market. Nestled in the neoprene sleeve, the Playbook is a 7 inch tablet with a clean and business like appearance. The Playbook is designed predominantly for landscape use, with the display dominating the front with a black surround. Stereo speakers flank the display with an indicator LED and 3 megapixel front facing camera up top and a logo underneath. The rear is finished in a soft touch plastic with a 5 megapixel rear facing camera and an inset BlackBerry logo. Connectivity wise, the unit has a micro HDMI output, a micro USB connection for both charging and data transfer, and a quick charge dock connector on the bottom. A 3.5mm headphone jack resides at the top, along with media and power buttons and openings for the internal microphones. The 7 inch 1024 by 600 resolution LCD screen is surrounded by a raised rubber surround, providing additional protection. The unit weighs a solid 425 grams and feels substantial despite the shell being made of plastics. The unit is powered by a dual-core 1GHz Texas Instruments OMAP 4430 based on the ARM Cortex-A9 architecture. It has 1GB of RAM and 16GB of flash memory, although there were 32 and 64GB models as well. It supports 802.11 ABGN Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 3.1 wireless connectivity, and had solid performance for the time. Startup of the QNX-based Playbook OS was not particularly quick as you will see. The Playbook launched on 19th April 2011 at a time when Apple had just announced the second generation iPad and it seemed that tablets would be the new thing, as smartphones at the time had much smaller screens than they do today. The Playbook did not sell well overall with an estimate of 2.5 million units sold throughout the lifetime and the platform being abandoned as of the end of June 2013, being left with Playbook OS 2.1 despite an earlier promise to deliver an upgrade to BlackBerry 10. On the 4th of January 2022, BlackBerry discontinued their legacy services including the Playbook, meaning the end of all support for the device. As a Playbook owner, I decided it was a good time to make a video about this device before it was forgotten entirely. The tablet came courtesy of a fire sale. Having missed out on an HP touchpad, I decided to grab this one for 122 Australian dollars, including postage, in August 2013, after its fate was already sealed. As it was old stock, I did have to disassemble it and manually charge a battery from an external supply to bring it back to life, but since then it has operated just fine. Video has been captured from the HDMI output, with some sequences shortened. The main operating system interface is fairly intuitive with tap and swipe gestures for various actions, including switching between applications. The touchscreen remains awake while the tablet sleeps, allowing you to swipe to wake up the tablet. Settings toggles can be accessed in the top right corner with the remainder of the settings inside a settings application. Information about this particular playbook is shown. The interface features animations all round and is mostly fluid with only a slight input latency. Unfortunately at this time, many applications will not work properly. This is in part due to changes to service APIs and SSL root certificates amongst other things. I've opened the messages app but have never used it. Here you can see me multitasking out of the app and launching the included web browser from the shortcuts bar. In this instance, the web browser will say that the network is unavailable, please try again later, when this is actually related to an SSL problem, rather than a problem in connectivity. In spite of this, I can still load my own blog and scroll around with the obligatory checkerboard rendering canvas display we so rarely see nowadays. Loading time is relatively slow compared to modern devices, no doubt due to the limited processing power, but to its credit it does get the job done eventually. The inbuilt clock has the skeuomorphic design which was common at the time. I guess analog clocks and stopwatches were just more classy. The weather app still works fine as well, based on AccuWeather.com.
Setting the home city allows the weather to be pulled up and displayed. The file manager shows what I had left on the tablet at the time I last used it in late 2013. Timetables, podcasts, music videos, memes and more. Opening a photo bounces you to the Photos app, which has a wood grain splash screen while it loads. Here we can see a relic of the past, Virgin Mobile, an MVNO that no longer serves the Australian market. The default wallpapers also come up in the picture gallery with the ability to run a slideshow. Fascinatingly, the display on the HDMI output is slightly different to the one on the inbuilt display in terms of the display controls. The camera app works too. Here we can see the dismal low light performance of the cameras indoors. First, the rear camera, and then the front. That's enough of me. Back to the playbook. As expected, the YouTube app no longer works, being stuck at a blank screen, but the logo and brown colour is a bit nostalgic. Acrobat Reader allows you to read PDFs. For example, the extinct UNSW Express Bus Services timetable, which was very important during my undergraduate years. But nowadays, there's not much to do with the playbook, so perhaps some people would like to use the Flip Clock app and just turn their playbook into a clock. Unfortunately, it will probably be too late to download the app, as the service's backends have been likely taken offline. Mocha VNC Lite can be used to remote control a computer over the network. This is an older version ported from Android, as can be seen in the bar below. Clicking on the eye brings up the player settings menu, which tells you about the menu bar and the Android back button. It still seems to do the job, in this case connecting to my Linux mode instance on the Digilent Analog Discovery Pro, running the waveforms program and using the oscilloscope module. ConnectBot was also ported over, and even though it's an older version, it still works too. Of note is the red highlight in the corner of the LCD, which is the OS's way of alerting you that you have a notification. This is in addition to the indicator LED, which will come on if the tablet is asleep. If you thought that the playbook was all work and no play, you'd be mostly right, with one exception. EA's Need for Speed Undercover was ported and optimised for the BlackBerry playbook. It is by far and away the best game and app that I have ever seen run on the playbook, but it isn't anything much compared to what is possible nowadays. It's a bit jittery, blocky around the edges, with crackly audio and input latency on the motion control which makes playing the game a little bit tricky. Gameplay is not noteworthy at all, it's basically a steering game with automatic acceleration, but the graphics do remind me of late DOS era SVGA graphics, definitely a highlight in the limited playbook catalogue of apps. It is not the easiest to play, especially with a cable dangling out of the bottom of the playbook, but here are some examples of the physics of the game, uh, grabbing a few style points and activating the boost.
Finally, BlackBerry World is the equivalent of the Android market, Google Play or the App Store, but it has always been rather anemic compared to the others, frequently lacking in choice and updates. Some of the apps packaged will seem familiar as they were ported from Android in an effort to bolster the library, but the lack of updates proved to be a problem. This may be due to limitations in supporting later Android API versions or a lack of interest from developers. Many of these useful apps may not have been published by trustworthy names, but without alternatives, one just had to give it a go. The BlackBerry world had transitioned to a free-only store back in 2018. So there we go. A quick tour of the BlackBerry Playbook OS and some of the apps I had installed on my Playbook. It should be noted that this was an ill-fated time for tablets, with the HP Touchpad based on WebOS also being launched in the same year, and after a short fire sale and 49 days of support, HP abandoned all WebOS devices. Thankfully, just a year later in 2012, Google was to launch the inexpensive Nexus 7, which proved to be extremely popular, winning many accolades. In the end, it seems that just being in the market is not enough to succeed, as it is the whole ecosystem of hardware, design, operating system, applications in the market, reasonable price, and manufacturer support that is necessary to make a device successful. For the playbook, it seems that it was just not meant to be. Even though the hardware was quite reasonable and the operating system was usable enough, the applications just weren't there despite their best efforts. This has been Goff of GoffLouis.com. Thanks for watching.